Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another study of a weekly Torah portion. Today, we study the portion of Tazria in the book of Leviticus. We're starting from selections from Lekutei Sichot, the first talk on page 191. Today, the study, the Torah study for us is dedicated in memory of Jacob Tesla um, mom, Rachel Batzevot. So an, an introduction. The Torah is talking about the idea of discoloration. I don't like the phrase leprosy because leprosy is contagious and this is not contagious. Also leprosy is discoloration of different types of colors. This is a very specific one. Right now we're gonna talk about the white, white. Later on, we will talk, the Torah will talk about yellow, the Torah will talk about red, but right now, the most of the discoloration called Sarat is white. There are certain, uh, there are three categories of discoloration that deem the situation non-kosher or something has to be done to rectify. It starts in the homes and the walls, and there are specific material, specific size, and it has to happen once, then again, and again. The second category is garments. Again, it has to turn into white. It's only in wool, not in um, um, whatever, um, not not anything plastic, or what do you call it? Uh, garments that are meant in material, polyester, synthetic. It, it applied to a specific type of material. And again, it happened a few times. And the third is on the skin of the person. We're going to talk about the skin of a person that comes third. <clears throat> now, it can happen on any part of the skin. It can happen in the hair, in the place of grow, hair growing. And that's a different color. That's yellow, I believe. But all the rest of the body is white. There is one prerequisite that the Kohen must call it Metzora or impure. If a man had a discoloration on his wrist or in his thigh, and it looks like the, the color and the measurement that makes it non impure, he can cover it and move on with his life. There is nothing wrong. In fact, there are times where we advise the person that he should not go to a Koyan, or the Koyan says, I don't see people today, you cannot come to me. Anybody knows when is that happens? What are the exceptions? So one is doing the holiday at Passover at the Seder. He discovered if he goes to a Koyan, the Koyan says, I'm sorry, I'm closed for business until after the holiday. Why? Because we want the person to celebrate the holiday amidst great joy. The second exception would be Hatan, groom and bride, within the seven days of their marriage. If at the chuppah, he suddenly discovers there is a color, a spot that changed in the skin, he goes to a coin, the coin says, I'm sorry, come to me, come back to me. When did you get married? Last night? Come to me in six days. The first seven days that we do not see. There is a clothes kasha. You know what a clothes kasha? A question that's very obvious. Huh? <laughs> and the clothes cache is being asked. I, I love the question. That's why I show it to you. I love the answer. The question is, the law is that if a chasson, if someone who got married uh, has a, a spot of discoloration and he goes to the coin and the coin says, I cannot see it. You go and celebrate with your wife for seven days. Anybody knows the reason for the discoloration? The reason is for speaking Lashonara, speaking uh, gossiping, which is one of the worst behavior. God makes it clear, equal to all three cardinal sins. But something, somebody asked the question, how is it possible someone who just got married should have this, this kind of a sign? After all, under the chuppah, God atoned all the person's sin, right? If he atoned these sins, he's pure, he's righteous. 
So he didn't do anything wrong. How is it possible to have spots in the morning? Do you understand the question, Bob? Anybody knows the answer? <laughs> His answer, you said it. <laughs> Must be the mother-in-law already rubbed them in the wrong direction. <laughs> so yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> a rabbi told me yeah. that that when his son got married, he told the mechutan, the father of the bride, my son didn't have any spots last night and today. It must be that his mother-in-law is a very special person that he has nothing bad to say about them. And, Got it, Harry. <laughs> I, can, I can see how you digest it. Actually, there is another answer, but it's not for now. Yeah. There is another answer to accommodate how is it possible for someone who just got married to be afflicted with a sign of committing a sin. After all, he is perfect. He, he, all these sins are done. There is a prerequisite to a discoloration impurity and that is that the koyhen must be fluently in the different types of colors and must say tahor pure or tameh impure if the koyhen didn't say it it's all good so if i have a house that has a spot the koyhen before entering to check make sure that the entire house, all the content is removed. Because if he calls it tamay, impure, everything in the house becomes impure. Water has to be spilled out. Some of the food cannot be consumed by a coin. Certain clay pottery cannot be kosherized. Glass, metal have to be uh, in, dipped in hot boiling water. It's a, it's a process. Same is about the garment. Don't don't go to the coin of the government. Go change, take it whenever it's convenient and show it to him. Or you, if you don't want to show it to him, that's okay. Same thing about the skin. If I am in, it's an inconvenience. I have a doctor. I have a dentist appointment. I can delay it for a day, two days, or I can just conceal it, and that's fine. The Rebbe is going to deal with the question: Why the Koyen is the one to go, call it? Bef and before the coin is calling it, it's not valid. It's not real discoloration. And that's the topic of the discussion. <laughs> it doesn't happen for 3,000 3, years already. Uh, page 191. There are two general laws regarding the ritual impurity of tzara'at blemishes. A, the assessment of a blemish in order to establish whether it is impure or not must be performed by a scholar trained in the field of knowledge, one who was instructed by his master and is thoroughly versed in all the blemishes in the names, including all those that affect a person and those that affect clothes and houses. That's it in the Talmud, Rambam. The scholar need not be a koyen. On the contrary, every knowledgeable scholar is acceptable to assess blemishes. So one prerequisite is that the person who is going to decide or to assess must be very well versed a tradition you received, practicing, learning different shades, different colors, different sizes, different parts of the body, where it happens, and very, very well versed. He has to do, do continuously practicing. B, the designation of a person, garment, or building as impure or pure is entirely dependent on a koyen. Even after the scholar determines that a blemish on a person's flesh is impure, he does not become impure until the Koyen states you are impure. Similarly, what's the point of the scholar? Similarly, because the Koyen is not very aware of what the different shades or different colors. Similarly, regarding his purification, even when he's healed from the Tsaras blemish, he remains in the state of in a state of impurity until the Koyen tells him you are pure. So in other words, you need to have someone who is knowledgeable to look at it. 
but you also need a coin to ask the, the rabbi. And the rabbi says, that's impure. That's pure. And the coin must call it pure or impure. Another part, let's say it went away, it's gone. Then only the coin can make him go back to be, to be pure. Even though it's clearly, and I had a video conference with a professional and he says, oh, that's okay. No problem anymore. Not enough. You cannot come back to your community. You cannot save the government or the house unless it is said by a coin, you are pure or you are impure for another week. How, uh, how was he determined to be so-called expert? I mean, he had a couple hundred thousand people. How many Kohanim were able to do this? And how did they learn this? Who taught them? So here we see that the coin don't need to be versed. It's the professional. You have like you have a cardiologist, you have a pulmonologist, you have a gastroenterologist. Each one is in to a specific area. You have one that was trained, received tradition, and went for you, anybody heard of Nida? Nida? Sure. I took training for different colors of spotting. And I really went to Baropak and I went to rabbis and I said, I'm the only one in a very large from Tampa all the way at the time to Naples. And I get visitors and they have questions and I want to learn. So he said, let me show you. And he gave me a stack of cut out garments, undergarments of women with different spots to learn about size, shape and colors. Today I don't because I, I I kept I did not continuously learning or practicing, but I learned different shades of red, for example. Back to our discussion is where you had rabbis who are trained in the specific colors, the specific sizes, and the locations. Also, it's about growth. In other words, the first time the coin sees it, he says to him, "You are impure." temporarily or, or just for a week. A week later, he has to go and see if it expanded. If it expanded, then he calls them impure. If it shrunk, then he calls them pure. If it's the same, he, he, he puts them away for a week, another for another seven days, and then the third time. If it didn't expand, he's pure. If it shrunk, he's pure. If it expanded, he's impure. So there are many, many details. For that, you have a scholar. The coin didn't need to know everything. But the Kohen, but the scholar will have to tell the Kohen what the rule is, is, and the Kohen will have to issue the verdict. And the same is about making him pure again. The professional will go and say to him, that's the way it should be. But the Kohen is following the instruction of the professional. Now, sometimes you have a Kohen who is versed in this law and he knows everything. That's fine. So you have all in one. But... Usually you have a professional and then you have a coin calling it, either pure or impure, calling it at the end of seven days or 14 days, telling the person you're pure or not. It has to be a coin, it can't be the, the professional. That's the point, right. The statement of the coin is determining factor, bringing about the person's or an object's state of impurity and purity. It's the Koyan's word that will change the real, the situation of the Koy of the government, the house, or the person. Therefore, even when a Koyan does not know how to assess blemishes, and even if the Koyan is a minor or mentally deficient, someone, a minor, a child, he relies on the words of the scholar. The scholar assesses the afflicted, afflicted person and tells the coin, say impure. And the coin says impure. Or he tells them, say pure. And the coin says, so even a minor can say that. But based on the professional's assessment. Clarification is necessary. So there may be something don't make sense. Hey, since the coin ultimately relies on the words of the scholar, why is the statement of the Koyan the determining factor? Why is he deciding pure or impure? Because of the one who is versed in the colors and the sizes, etc. So skip that. Save some money. 
You don't need to have so many people in the factory. You can remove some people and make it directly from the scholar because that's at the end of the day, that's what God wants. God wants to send a message to the person so that he speaks, Lashon Ara, he should know. Oh, that's a warning. Okay, so you have a scholar who knows what God's God's desire and let the coin, let the professional say, why do you need the coin in the middle? Why do you need a middleman? Yes. So even coins who can't serve in the temple. Of course. Who aren't fit to serve in the temple. Mentally deficient. As long as his father and all the way a coin. B. By the way, this is halacha in Rambam. This is halacha in Gemara that a minor or a, a, a mentally deficient koyin can call it, but it has to be valid. In other words, I just studied it in Rashi this morning that if the koyin calls it impure or calls it pure, and the real, reality is it's not, it has no value. You understand what I'm saying? What he's saying, yes. But in action, it says Tamei Tamei Ka, says Rashi, it's in the Talmud, that only when it's really impure, that's when he's calling it impure, is valid. In other words, if he calls it falsely, it has no value. So on the other one end, he does, he's not the one who makes it pure and pure. Because if he calls it impure, or calls it pure, and the reality is it's not, it has no value for his words. He needs to call it only after the professional determines the situation and then the coin calls after. I want to stick just to the topic because as is, we're not going to do more than half. Dika, uh, uh, the coin makes a bad call. Where does it go from there? The person calls a professional, a second opinion says, what do you say? He says, this is, uh, what did he tell you? It's impure? No, it's not true. Okay. He calls the coin and says, how did you, did you say that? Here is the facts. And, the co and therefore, the person is pure. Simple so as that. Second professional can override. Second, third, body. yeah, all the time. Harry? No. Number two. What is the unique aspect of the impurity of Tzavra's blemishes that specifically regarding them, the Torah introduces this novel concept that impurity and purity is dependent on a coin. Why is this? That's the only time, pure and pure. When it, someone touched a dead corpse, when someone was under the roof of a dead human, they become impure regardless of the coin's knowledge. You don't need a coin to be there. Here, the only determination is the coin calling it. As I told you, if the man decides to not, to skip coin, to skip bringing it out, to skip sharing it, he's okay, there is no sin committed, and he's pure. So if it's in my thigh, and all in my hand, and I start wearing gloves, and they ask me, why are you wearing gloves? I say, because of COVID, I don't want to cover, I don't want to get uh, cont cont uh, contagious. That's okay, you're pure, you're okay. Only if the coin saw it and says pure or impure, that's when it becomes. Why, this is the only time and this is something new. What's the uniqueness of this? Yes. You're, you're good. Yes. Ah, not, not only that, the same as the house, same as the garment. So if someone is under the roof, someone, God forbid, died, and the person is in that room, they become impure, will take them seven days and the red air for sprinkling. It has nothing to do if they knew about it or not. It has nothing to do if they ask someone or not. It is a fact that happened immediately upon the, the facts. Sarat, number one, you need the Koyan to say it, number, even if he doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, if, uh, uh, emotionally deficient, mentally deficient. Number two, this is the only time that what will make it or not is the coin calling it. And that makes unusual. It's a novel idea that introduced in this case, in this category and nothing else. True, this is a scriptural decree, Hawk, a divine fiat that transcends human logic. You can say, well, it, this is in the category of Hukka, Hukka meaning it doesn't make sense. Nevertheless, as Rambam taught, even though the Torah's hukim and decrees 
it is befitting to contemplate them and what whenever it is possible to provide a reason such a reason should be provided in other words even in the category of no common sense we need to try and de delve into it and try and find a reason here too you can answer that's the way god wanted it's the exception to the rule but if god but at the same time part of jewish law is to try and find a reason in why well, you don't have to understand but that's a reality you're not supposed to find the reason and you're not supposed to guarantee to have the reason but if you can find dig into the reason behind that you should i thought you should guarantee i thought a guarantee king solomon history. king solomon says he found a reason for every one of the hukim except paraduma except red effer and king and and moish rabbeinu asked for the red effer and god said to him when you reach the gate the 50th gate and the day of passing i'll teach it to you and it was done so everything is a reason the thing is, God did not choose to share with us. So if he chose not to share it with us, how can we find it? Because he gives us, he wants us to dig in. Sometimes it's beneath the surface. You have to dig to find it. In particular, this applies to a reason which enables us to improve our character traits, as Rambam states. Most of the Torah's laws are nothing other than counsels, to improve our character and make all aspects of our conduct upright, especially finding the reason will help us be a mensch, live better life, connect to God better. Then we need to search for the reason, even if God did not give us a reason. Or to refer to the Torah's wording, God commanded us all these sta statues so that we fear God. That is, Every law in the Torah is an instruction teaching to the fear of God. So when you find the reason, it enables us to fear God to a greater degree. In other words, if I know the reason, it makes me con connect to God on a higher level, and it makes me stick to that law better than if I have no reason. And therefore, we need to dig and, and, and search for the reason. When I'm going to address Ali, because I care about Ali so much, here I'm going to try give it one try. Although I can try in many ways, I have some spare about. When we say that Torah has three categories, a dot hukim and mishpatim, a do, uh, uh, mishpatim is common sense that you don't need God, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother. Makes sense. Without Torah, a dot, God explained it to us that it makes sense. Skip Shabbat because to remind us that God created the universe celebrate passover to remind us that we were slaves and to cherish freedom celebrate sukkot to appreciate the outdoors each holiday has a purpose but that god gives us but you wouldn't create it on your own okay that's okay. clear okay. hukim make no sense yeah. never does not make sense however if you search deep you can understand the rationale behind it. You find the rationale, then it continues. Now, once, you once you find the rationale, it helps you keep that law to a greater degree than if you have no rationale. Mm -hmm. In addition, you're serving God because you are finding rationale for a God decree, and that's what God wants us. So it enables us to feel God to a greater degree. What can we do in so we we will discuss that. Shatnes is made out of plant, wool is animal, and linen is a plant. Mix those two categories is inappropriate. Some say one is chesed, kindness, the other represents gvura, strictness. Same is milk and meat. It's hukim. But once you understand how it works in the spiritual realms, you understand that. I just want to say that um, I, I had something to... Oh, I'm, I, I, that's why there is so much I can talk about. Imagine the doctor tells you no more starch. And you say, why? He says, because your sugar level is, is very high. You're diabetic. And I say to the doctor, okay, so no more sugar in my coffee, I understand. But what's wrong with bread? He says, because bread is starch. Starch is sugar. And you say, starch is not sugar. Star starch is, is bread, is wheat. And he says, no, it's that's the law. That's the rule. No corn, no potatoes, no bread, no spaghetti, no pasta. And you say, why? Now you go, you go to a dietitian and they say, you know, let me show you how it works. The spaghetti turned into sugar. Now, 
to me, it sounded like hook when the doctor says no spaghetti, no corn, corn, one half corn, potato, come on. Potato tatters is something that my favorite. Once you see the reason behind it, now it makes sense. Why does it help making sense? Because when a new child says, I'm making potato tatters, you want to join me? You say, no, it says, come on, you like it. I say, I know I like it, but it's turned into sugar. So in the spiritual realm, of course it makes sense. In the physical universe, it doesn't. But if you dig deeper, you might find it's not always, not for everybody, but it helps you have greater feel of God and serving God better. I don't want to address it anymore. I think I, I uh, satisfy. Is that the equivalent of supreme? Which one? Super rational. Super rational. Hmm? Is that the same? Supreme is super rational. It's not. There's not a subset. No, no. It's just, that's the word. That's that's. It's a translation. The fundamental, noble dimension of the Torah's decree. That the ritual purity and purity of a person of ab of, of of object afflicted by tzarat is dependent on a coin is expressed primarily by the fact that he determines the person or object to be impure, and less so by the fact that it is he who determines his or its state of purity, and uh, afterwards, what the rabbi is saying that you need a coin for both ends. You need a koyen to make the person enter into the state of impurity. You also need a koyen to get them out of impurity. No one can, the professional comes and says, that's okay, there is no more problem anymore. You can go back to life. It's not enough. He needs a koyen, we need a koyen to say it. Says the Rebbe, I understand if you need a koyen to get them out. Because the koyen is a kind person, is a guide's agent. Therefore, he's there to make your life better, so to say, to improve your life, to make you holier, connect to, back to people. Because a koyen is known as ish achesed. Koyenim are kind people. Aaron, Aaron, the father of all the koyenim, what was his uh, greatest trait? Oeb shalom verodev shalom. You'd bring peace between partners, between our spouses. So Aaron is the symbol of kindness. Kindness is bringing back the person to his family. He was alone. He was without family, without his wife, without his children and community. You bring him back. Makes sense. You have a koi and do it. But take him out of society, remove him from family and spouses. That makes no sense for a koi. Says the Rebbe. And here is the summary of what I told you. It's a second paragraph on page 193. This is difficult to understand. Where the fundamental novel dimension of the Torah's decree to be, that the purification of the affected by, by Tzolat is dependent upon the Koyen, that would be understood to bring him back, since the function of a Koyen is associated with a state of ritual purity, as reflected by the law that a Koyen may not intentionally contract ritual impurity. Koyanim are the one who draw down ritual purity on the Jewish people. And therefore, to bring them back to the state of purity, you can assign a koyan. God will make the koyan because that's all he is about. However, why is it that a koyan is the one who determines and causes a Jew to become ritually impure? It's the exact opposite of what a koyan represents. It should be, should be the opposite. Find somebody else. Find a rabbi to do it. Find somebody, but not a koyan. In addition that you affect that you don't even need a koyan to have a full knowledge, a minor, and mentally deficient. Here is the, by the way, the Rebbe addressed this question in many occasions in many, many different ways. Here is one of them. It is possible to offer the following explanation of the, for the above. There is a dimension of severity to the impurity associated with Sarat blemishes that does not exist regarding other state of ritual impurity. Says the Rebbe, there is many categories of impurity. You can be contracted impurity by touching a dead corpse. You can have impurity by emission, em emitting uh, fluids. For women, it's blood. For men, it's uh, uh, white. There is a impurity of fighting a war with non-Jews. There is different impurities, different categories. None is as harsh as tzarat, as impurity of discoloration. 
a person afflicted with Sarat must dwell alone outside the camp where he lives. Indeed, he is sent outside the three camps that define the Jewish community. Moreover, he must be totally isolated. Other impure people should not dwell with him. The place where a person afflicted by Tzad must dwell is apart for, uh, uh, even from the place where other impure people dwell. Says the Rebbe, impurity for Tzad, for the discoloration, is so unique, it's so harsh, nothing is similar. So if someone uh, contracted a dead corpse, he can, he, huh? he, he stays home. He, he can stay home. He does not, shouldn't touch anybody. But he can stay home. He can sit on the same table and eat as long as his food is separated. He can socialize. He can go to work. He can answer the phone. He can go on social media and take photos. Ha ha, I'm very healthy and very happy. He's living a good life, except he cannot enter the camp of the Koyanim. He cannot bring a sacrifice. Passover comes. He has to bring a sacrifice. He's not allowed. He's not allowed to eat holy food like... Um, Second tithe, the, um, uh, uh, tithe for, for poor people that, that is given to Israelite Bechorim. There is all kinds of uh, food that came that is part of God's share. He is not allowed to take part of. But he's allowed to socialize with people. Metzorah, someone who is afflicted with this affliction, not only has to be away from his wife, children, parents, family, class, if he's in yeshiva out, all three camps. Israelite, Levites, and Koyanim. Uh, if he's a Koyan, he has to remove not from Levites, but from Israelites and outside. But in addition, he needs to be alone. If there is a family of four, as we're going to read about in Passover, that there were four people who had afflicted with Tzarat, they were the children of Gehazi. If anybody knows the story of the Bible, they had to be separately living. So not only outside the Jewish camp, not only family and, and friends, but other people as well. But that Yeshev, lonely and alone, he must reside. This is very unusual. But why would he necessarily be alone? What? Other people are also outside because it's Ras and it's Ras camp. Not allowed. Not allowed. So four people have to Ras and They were totally separate homes, no talk to each other. Nothing. That's the point. In other words, if I contracted impurity by dead corpse or by omission, mm -hmm. I can live in my camp. I cannot go to Koyan camp. I cannot live by camp some, but I can live with my family. Even if you need me to get out, you cannot separate me from our people in the same category. Here, the same category, they're not allowed to be alone. That takes it the farthest you can go. Alone, alone. So if you have a husband and wife who contracted it, probably because they were talking too much Lashon Allah in the community. What happened? She goes one way, he goes the other way. They're not allowed to communicate, not even social media, no FaceTime. No broken. Huh? No broken. <laughs> no. No bill collectors. No bill collectors. <laughs> this is also the spiritual implication of Tsarat impurity. It is such a serious state of impurity that it causes the afflicted person to be completely distanced from the camp of holiness. He is, as it were, isolated from any connection to the Jewish people, God's holy nation. He totally isolated from the Jewish people. Even Jewish people who have the same, he has to be isolated from them. Given the, the seriousness of such a state, the Torah asks, who is the one who can determine whether another Jew should be banished, heaven forbid, from the camp of holiness? Only a coin. Why? A coin's fundamental function is to bless his nation Israel with love. He is a man of kindness who blesses Jewish people and does not as does so lovingly. As is well known, the blessing of the Kohanim and the holidays of in Israel every Shabbat or the Monday Thursday. It is an essential requirement that the priestly blessing be rectified with love and there can be a dangers 
A dangerous consequences of a coin who recites a blessing without those feelings. For this reason, because a coin is a man of kindness, the Torah relies only on him to deliver the ruling of a Jew, that a Jew must be banished outside the camp where he lived. Anybody heard of priestly blessings? How do you say the prayer before they start the priestly blessing? Levarech, to bless the Mo Israel, Be'ahava, with love. If a Kohen has a dispute with a member of the congregation, it's dangerous for the Kohen to make the priestly blessing. It will have a boomerang on the Kohen. I grew up where they did a, bless, a priestly blessing every day. Sephardic Jews in Israel, they do it every morning, every morning, and some of them do it every afternoon. In the Chabad communities in Israel, I believe Monday and Thursday they do, and Shabbat. But if there is a Sephardic Kohen in the middle, he would go up and do the priestly blessings. Every Kohen, before they go, they need to let go of any hateful feeling they have towards anyone in the room. So in Yeshiva, we had a lot of friction. A Kohen <laughs> always had to be on a good side of everybody. Otherwise, I had once a peace <laughs> fight with a Kohen, and he wouldn't go. We, we remained enemies for a long time. He wouldn't go to priestly blessings because it's dangerous for him. God says you have to bless with love. In other words, the embodiment of love and loving the Jewish people is a Kohen. So when you have someone who must be totally ripped apart from the Jewish people to an extreme, God had chosen the one that must love the Jew over anyone else. Based on, yes. Sorry. So one has to be in a good terms with everyone in his life or just people that are in the People that are included in his blessing. But if you have a bad terms with someone else, and that yes. people find it, yes. he's not better than that. Right. Or well, they may choose not to go up. I, I, as a child, I knew some elderly yeshiva boys, older people, and I would say to him, you're a coin, why don't you want? He says, no, I don't want. And uh, later on, I, I would grill them, or my father, he says to me, they have a good reason. Maybe they don't like someone in the room, so they, they, they can't go up. They cannot do the priestly blessings. Mm -hmm. That's why... The conclusion, <laughs> Rambam writes that the reason the Koyanim are the ones to determine, as we said, even if they have no mind of their own, they are mentally deficient or they are minor, is because God chose them to bless the Jewish people of love. They are the one to be the to determine if it's good or not. Here is the application for our day-to-day -day life, page 196. There is, I'm going to finish off, Ali soon. There is a clear directive from the above, applicable in every era and place. When one sees that a fellow Jew has an undesirable quality, heaven forbid, to the extent that he is in such a deplor deplorable state that he has taken himself outside of the collective and thus is unworthy of being together with the Jewish people, a hasty decision may not be made. The Torah dictates that even a great scholar learned in the entire Torah, who, whose analysis stemming from the wisdom of the Torah leads to the ass assessment that such a person must be distanced from others and sent outside the camp where he lives may not immediately deliver such judgment regarding another Jew. Before doing so, he must carefully examine himself regarding his own level of kindness and about Israel, the love for one's fellow Jew. If a person does not have the characteristic qualities of a Koyan, that is, he is lacking in genuine Avat Israel. He does not have the right to issue such a ruling regarding another Jew. It is possible that his inclination to deliver such a ruling does not stem solely from analysis based on Torah's wisdom, but rather results from his own undefined character traits. Says the Rebbe, be careful before you pass judgment on a fellow Jew. Even if you go and look in code of law and you see that that person is deserving of the worst punishment, just look internally and say, am I coming from a Kohen point of view, a loving, kind person? If not, I'm not the, the one to deliver that message. 
I have to find a koyan, just like a koyan who had no mind of his own. A koyan who is a minor is the only one who can call pure or impure, and without which no, nothing happens as the unique, because every time, every other time, it's a start to do with the facts, not with the coin calling. Same is about taking someone outside the camp, excommunicating, criticizing, putting someone out. He does not belong, he's not good. We shouldn't count on him. We shouldn't, we shouldn't count that person. You need to be a Korean first and out of love, and then you can pass that judgment. And I think this is a very powerful message, as the Rabbi points out. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.